So I've been getting a lot of questions recently on what is this new Wi-Fi 6E technology that I read about a little bit, you know, guy down the street told me about it. And I want to clear up some misconceptions around what it is and go over in this video today, guys, how it could be possibly beneficial for us. So the first thing that I want to talk about is that Wi-Fi 6E really isn't anything new. All Wi-Fi 6E is, is allowing us to use 802.11ax in the 6 gigahertz frequency. As you guys know, for a long time, we've been using 2.4 gigahertz and we've been using 5 gigahertz. The FCC is talking about opening up that 6 gigahertz frequency range for your Wi-Fi use and Wi-Fi 6E is basically just the marketing around being able to use that. The IEEE spec for 802.11ax really shows that AX technology can be used from one gigahertz all the way up to that seven gigahertz range there. Uh, and then, you know, we've got the Wi-Fi Alliance that comes in. They like to put kind of cute names around things, you know, Wi-Fi 6, that's 802.11ax, Wi-Fi 6E, okay, it's just another marketing name thing and it allows us to, you know, take advantage of that six gigahertz frequency range. So really all it is is the Wi-Fi Alliance kind of coming in and promoting now that the, that capability may be there potentially in the future. So guys, if you just bought 802.11ax access points, that's great. They're still amazing access points. They're still as current as you could possibly be. Um, you would need new hardware and you would also need new clients if you wanted to get into that six gigahertz range. And, you know, I'm going to get into some of the technical details around this in a second here where, you know, where it makes sense to do something like that and where it might not make sense to do something like that. So with that, let me share my screen, guys, and we'll kind of go into some of the technical specs around what Wi-Fi 6E does for us and how it could be beneficial. So let's start talking about some of the technical details here on why 6E or using that 6 gigahertz frequency could be beneficial. In order to do that and understand that, we're going to start talking about some of the shortcomings around the 5 gigahertz spectrum. And for a long time, guys, we used the 5 gigahertz spectrum to get away from the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum because that had a lot of shortcomings. You know, in 2.4 gigahertz, I only had three non-overlapping 20 megahertz channels. So I go to the 5 gigahertz spectrum, I've got less noise, I've got more channels to mess around with. And for a long time, that was enough. You know, if you take a look at the 5 gigahertz allocation here, and I took this right off of Eka Howe's website, they had a nice chart of it. You know, I had a decent amount of channels. I've got eight or nine channels I can use in the Uni 1 and Uni 3 bands here. And for a long time, again, that was fine. Nine overlapping channels or eight overlapping channels was plenty for me to work with. Then once new technology started coming out, like 802.11n, AC, and AX, we started doing things like channel bonding. So in 802.11n, we started bonding 20 megahertz channels together, giving us 40 megahertz channels. And now my resources or non overlapping channels go down because of that. So in 40 megahertz, you guys can take a look here from utilizing the Uni 1 and Uni 3 bands. I've only got four non overlapping channels 38, 46, 151, and 159. Again, not that big of a deal. Most deployments, I could still make that work and we were totally fine. Then when AC rolled around and now AX, we start talking about 80 megahertz wide channels or 160 megahertz wide channels. Well, when we start looking at 80 megahertz wide channels, if I want to stay within the Uni 1 and Uni 3 bands, I only have two non-overlapping channels. And that's where we start to run into some issues. So to overcome that, we can do things like, okay, let's start going into this Uni 2 band here, the Uni 2A or Uni 2C or Uni 2 Extended, but there's some shortcomings around this Uni 2 area here. The biggest one being this need for DFS. And what DFS is, is dynamic frequency selection, which basically says that if there is radar going on, maybe you live near an airport or near some government facility and they're shooting radar, you need to be able to move off of any of these channels in the Uni 2 band and let the radar go through, wait a little while, check to make sure the radar is done, and then you can go back to the channel that you were using. The other problem with that is a lot of times you get false positives. I know a lot of the Cisco access points have filters in them to try to avoid some of those false positives in there and everything, but 
you do still have some of those types of issues. And, you know, if you're trying to set a channel plan here, having to be able to jump off all the time to avoid these channels can be problematic. So a lot of people don't really like to use these channels here. You can, but even if we are using uni two channels, you guys can still see here that once we get up to 160 megahertz wide channels, again, we run into the issue where I've only got two non-overlapping channels that I can work with. You might be able to get away with it on the 80 megahertz channel bonding here, but definitely not on 160 megahertz. So that's really where, hey, in order to do this, we need more spectrum. So let's take a look now at what that six gigahertz range looks like and what that's gonna allow us to do. So I pulled this table off of the FCC's website here and this kind of lays out for us what they're gonna start opening up and really the spectrum starts at 5.925 gigahertz and goes all the way up to 7.125 gigahertz. So it gives us about 1.2 gigahertz, you know, 1,200 megahertz of additional spectrum that we previously never had before. Uh, well, the, one of the interesting things that I saw when I was actually researching this is what is this space actually used for today? And I kind of had that question even going in before I started making this video. I was like, well, why are they opening up? What's using it today? And really today it's used for earth to space type of communication through microwaves. So that could be a satellite on the ground talking to a satellite in space, maybe a ground station talking to a space station up above somewhere. And, you know, typically those are very high powered devices sending information back and forth because it has to talk all the way from the ground, you know, miles into space. So when the government was opening this up, you know, I was like, well, there's really not going to be much contention because we're talking about such low power devices inside that there's no way these things are going to really interfere with what's going on in the outside world with these earth to space type communications. And I'm pretty sure that's what the government is thinking here as well. So let's take a look at this, this spectrum in a little bit more detail. So I've got 1,200 megahertz of available bandwidth now in here. And if we really break that down, that gives us 59 20 megahertz channels or 59 non-overlapping channels. That's a heck of a lot more than where we started with, with 802.11b, where in 2.4 gigahertz, where I only had three non-overlapping channels. So, you know, right off the bat, I've got 59 20 megahertz channels. We start pairing that back a little bit because we're going to start doing channel bonding. If I go to 40 megahertz channels, I'm at 29 non-overlapping. If I get to 80 megahertz wide channels, I'm at 14 non-overlapping channels. And if I want to do 160 megahertz wide channels, then we're down to seven non-overlapping channels, which if you guys remember from the other chart I had up here, at 80 megahertz, unless I want to go into this uni2 band with all the caveats, I only had two non-overlapping channels. So where I think six gigahertz is really going to start to play is once we want to really get into this 80 megahertz range here and start channel bonding with 80 megahertz, then I think you're going to really want to start looking at, hey, is six gigahertz right for my organization? You know, you will have to purchase new devices. You will need to purchase new access points to get into this range. But if it's important for you to have 80 megahertz wide channels or 160 megahertz wide channels for the speed for the throughput, then, you know, it's something you may want to consider. The other thing that I was thinking as I was doing this is, you know, what are some other use cases that we might want this additional spectrum for? And, you know, we could also use this for backhaul type of technologies. So typically when we look at mesh style access points today, you know, they typically communicate on their backhaul across like five gigahertz and then clients can associate to those access points, those mesh access points on 2.4 gigahertz. Well, if I've got another part of the spectrum here that I can use, I can actually have the communication between the access points go on 6 gigahertz, and then clients can start joining on 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz, giving me a little bit more in terms of bandwidth, more radios, things like that, to increase some of my spectrum um, for some of my mesh access points. So I think this is something that we are just on the cusp of actually seeing a need for it. You know, I think as as we start getting more Wi-Fi only offices, a lot more throughput going through them, the need for higher density access points, 
the need for higher density clients in a particular area, I think we're eventually going to need to get into the six gigahertz space because once we start increasing those, those channel widths, we're going to run into some issues. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you guys want to have a conversation around this, please post it in the comments. I'm curious to see what your guys' thoughts are on this as well. And as always, you know, if you like this video and you like what I'm doing on this channel, please subscribe and give me a thumbs up. Thanks a lot.